No, Betty, no. Don't make me... I say yes. It's got to be now and here. She's got to die. Betty. I say yes. Here. I'll hold her arm. All right, Betty. But... No, 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 no. I don't want to die. I... Midnight. The witching hour when the night is darkest. Our fears the strongest. And our strength at its lowest ebb. Midnight. When the graves gape open and death strikes. How? You'll learn the answer in just a minute in Nightmare. of Mystery and Terror by Radio's Masters of the Macabre. Our story by Joseph Ruskall is one of the most terrifying and fantastic nightmares we've ever heard. Its title, Nightmare. some sleep. Oh. oh, thank heaven. Oh, it was... It must have been just a dream. Oh, thank Lord, Betty. Oh, Bernie, it was so real. I dreamed somebody was leaning over me just now with a pillow. Oh, it was horrible. They were trying to smother me to death. And, and Ernie... Yeah? It was you. What? Oh, 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 don't mind me, but that, that horrible nightmare, it seemed so real. Oh, darling, wasn't that crazy? You, the sweetest, gentlest husband in the world. Well, then why... Oh, Ernie, now please, don't look so hurt. Now I can't even look hurt. I just murdered my wife in her sleep, didn't I? No, you were just about to. I mean... I... Oh, now what the... Everything's happening tonight. Hello. What? Who? Wrong number. And what's more, this is a heck of a time to be ringing. Why, what a nerve. <laughs> All night. Thought maybe that was the police you phoned in your dream. Now, now will you go to sleep? Ernie Kraft, I'm sure I didn't mean to insinuate anything. I was just telling you my dream. You asked, didn't you? Oh, you're a character. I guess I'll have to put you in that book I never wrote, too. <gasps> well, now what? That was in it, too. Huh? That book you never wrote. You nagged about it so much, no wonder. Oh, and that look when you bent over me like a madman. Oh. Ernie, what on earth do you suppose made me have a nightmare? That's easy. You would insist on eating hamburgers after the show tonight. Yes, I did, didn't I, when we got out of the movies. Hamburgers, of course. Ernie, they were part of my dream, too. Hamburgers. Ernie, stop punching on that pillow, please. All right, all right. Go ahead, then. Better tell me your dream, all of it. Neither of us will sleep until you do. I'll just light this butt. Now, let's have it. Some gruesome details. Well, I don't know if I can remember now. It was all so hazy and terrifying. Well, what happened before I smothered you with a pillow? A crazy quilt. Something about your job, and I was a millstone around your neck, and hamburgers, and you hated me, and July 15th, 
Life with Dee. Yes, I can't imagine what that meant. Look, look, start at the start. Why did I decide to murder you? Because of that other woman, your secret love. Huh? You promised her you'd kill me tonight when I was asleep. My secret love? Yes, she had you in her spell. Oh, that's kind of bad casting, isn't it, Butch? I'm the dish, dishes and dustpan type, remember? In the five years we've been married, have I ever looked I at know, another... I know, I know. I told you it was a crazy dream. Maybe you want me to eliminate my one night a week out, too. My Saturday gin rummy with the boys. Oh, no. Uh, who was my secret love? Did she uh, have a face? <laughs> well, this is the silliest part of it, Ernie. It's absolutely ridiculous. It was that girl, Betty Daniels. Betty Daniels? Yeah. Who's she? You remember that tall, dark-haired artist I introduced you to at Cape Cod last summer? Cape Cod? At Co the exhibition. No, I don't... Oh, wait a minute. Trousers, <laughs> long cigarette holder, yes. very intense. Yes, very intense. But what the devil... What was she doing in your dream? We said hello to her, we walked off, and that was that. Uh, casual. Yes, I know. I hardly remember her myself. I can't imagine why I dreamt of her. Why? No, no, no don't touch me. Don't. No, no. Oh, that dream, that awful dream. So crazy. And yet it seemed to be telling me something, warning me. and weird. You know how dreams are. First thing I remember is Province Town and us looking at the art exhibition just the way we did last summer. Only now the picture was about ten feet tall and hanging crooked. And then she came along. Betty Daniels. Just the way she did then. Hello, Helen. And I introduced you the same as I did then. Only not exactly the same, like in a dream, you know, silly. Betty Daniels, this is my husband, Ernest. He is very faithful to me. How do you do? How do you do? We've never met. That's a marvelous girl you're painting, Helen, don't you think? Or do you prefer hamburgers? Well, I... My wife prefers hamburgers, Miss Daniels. Oh, oh, I didn't know. Only after a movie, though. Anyway, I'm sure I can't tell one painting from another. My husband's the art lover in the family, I guess. And I just tag along for the fish. Only I don't like fish. I like hamburgers. I know. You don't wear trousers like I do. You're fluffy. Betty and I met on the beach here, and she's a painter. Our rowboats got tangled. That's how we met. Yes, it was all very casual. I hardly remember. Well, well. Ernie and I are going back to New York today. Isn't that a shame? I wish you two wouldn't stare at each other so. Well, we better run along, Helen. <laughs> Lots of packing to do. Ernie has got to get back to his silly old job. He's a reporter. A reporter? Shouldn't he write a book he never wrote? Well, imagine that's what he always says. Well, goodbye. I'm wondering why I'm thinking of you now. Goodbye. 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 The scenes sort of dissolve into each other, like a kind of dream movie. And I'm trembling with fright because I have a feeling I know how the plot's going to end. The next thing I remember, Ernie, I'm in a penthouse apartment on Park Avenue. Everything zigzag, even the butler. And I'm the maid, Helen, there. And what I'm doing is turning pages for Betty Daniels while she plays the piano. For you, Ernie. Isn't that crazy? Neither of you hardly notice me at all. And I keep trying to open my mouth. Uh, uh, like that. But it's stuck. And I'm absolutely frozen at what I overhear. Darling. Yes, Butch. Love our love nest. Out of this world. Ah, this is heaven. Ernie, do you ever call your wife Butch? Never. What gave you that idea? I hate the very sight of her. <laughs> She's really a little ignoramus. You're telling me she prefers hamburgers. Ernie, do you think she suspects yet? Of course not. She thinks I met a gin rummy game. Darling, you're blind, but she's not. She knows. She knows? How? How'd she find out? You may go, Helen. Helen, do you hear me? Why don't you go? Answer me. Have you lost your tongue? Oh, well, there's murder in the air. How'd she find out, Betty? Tell me. Darling, do you suppose she doesn't know what happened last summer in Provincetown? After we all said goodbye and came to look for your cigarette lighter, that... She knew you hadn't lost your lighter, that you'd come back to ask me for my <laughs> New York telephone number. Uh, 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 she knew? Of course, intuition. 
She knows we've been having a secret affair ever since. Uh, 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 I can't go on like this. I'm tired of being just a gin rummy excuse. Ernie, if you love me, you, you'll do what I promised. But I pity her so. Don't be a fool. Isn't it her fault you never wrote that book you never wrote? It's true. She wouldn't let me give up my job. She's a millstone around my uh, neck. Uh, and get rid of her, Ernie. Get rid of her, and I'll bring your genius to the world. I've plenty of money, and you can, you can give up reporting and write that book. Fulfill your destiny. Fulfill my destiny. Oh, Betty, you'll help me. Yes. But only if you forget July 15th. You forget about July 15th. It won't mean a thing to you from now on. Not a thing. I promise you. And you'll do away with it. The way I told you. Yes. Like you told me. The pillow. The pillow. Uh, 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 Don't you hear? Just look at her standing there at the piano. You've been spying on us, Helen, haven't you? Haven't you? Answer, have you lost your tongue? Now, don't try to fool us. We know you're the real Helen and, and not the maid. She's heard everything you've said, Ernie. So we'll have to kill her now. Unless, unless she gives me a divorce. Will you give him a divorce? Answer or we'll finish you right now. Very well. Here's the pillow, Ernie. Right now. I'll hold her on. <laughs> Answer, Helen. Don't make me do it. Answer, Helen. I pity you, but I hate you. Let her cry. Look at her. Stricken dumb. Her mouth moving, but she's not saying anything. What are you trying to say? Helen, please don't make me do it. Will you give me a divorce? Tell me. Tell me. Uh, Ernie! Uh, Ernie, stop! Fools we are. Do you want her body found here? Fine for it. She's got it. She's got no, it. No, no, not here. Not like this. There must be some other way. Later tonight, Ernie. After the movies. Hamburgers. She'll get hungry for hamburgers. She's bound to. The waiter will ask her how she wants them. That'll give you the clue. And then, when she's asleep. <laughs> And they'll find her in her bed. <laughs> the perfect crime. Don't you see, Ernie? Hamburgers. A frightened girl reliving a dream that was more terrible than any reality. A dream that could even become more terrible. As the clock on the mantel takes on. And the hands draw closer to 12 o'clock and... Murder. Midnight. And now back to Murder at Midnight and Nightmare. Well, let's hear the rest of this dream of yours, Helen. What happened after that? Well, it was after that that it really got bad. It was so crazy, but so real. I don't know what stopped you, Ernie, kept you from killing me then, but you didn't. And still, I knew you were going to. You dragged me out into the street and then into a movie and then out again. And I looked at you and you were crying because you'd made up your mind to finish me off when we got home. You should have let me write that book, Helen. You should have. And I kept crying, I love you, Ernie. Don't kill me, please don't kill me tonight. But I've got to. I've got to. I pity you, but I've got to. And you pulled me along through the streets again. I was terrified. And then I saw a policeman and I cried to him, officer! Yes? What is it, lady? Please save me. My husband here wants to kill me. Oh, who wants to kill you? Eh? <laughs> Why, that's a crime. <laughs> a felony. Oh. Why are you joking? Don't joke about it. Do something, please. I'm frightened to death. Don't pay any attention to her, officer. She's dreaming. I'm not. Don't believe him. He wants to wait till I go to sleep tonight. And then as soon as I fall asleep... Oh, first... come now, lady. He wouldn't do it to you in your sleep. Why, you're cute. Not in her sleep, now. Would you, mister? Of course not, officer. Not in her sleep. As a matter of fact, we're stopping off first for a hamburger. She's hungry. No, 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 I'm not. I mean, I am, but I don't dare. I'm starving, but I don't dare. He's just waiting for me to order one, officer, to see what I'll say. And then he'll take me home and kill me. Oh, 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 oh. lady, stop. Sure, and you're breaking me hard. <laughs> Come along, dear. No, no, officer, please protect me. Don't let him take me, please. Come along, I say, darling. And then we were in the little lunchroom in our neighborhood, around the corner from our house, sitting on stools. 
the counter man came over to us. He winked at you, Ernie, and you winked back at him, and he said... Evening, folks. What do you have? He looked at me, but I shook my head. I shook my head, and the tears were streaming down my face. I tell you what, Joe. Make it two hamburgers. <laughs> right. Rare, medium, or well? Medium, Joe. Make mine medium. Right. And the little lady? How do you have yours, Helen? How do you like yours? <laughs> Make hers medium, too. Two hamburgers, medium. Two medium, coming out. And what do you have on them, folks? Relish or onion? Relish. Make mine with relish, Joe. Right. And the little lady? Man's talking to you, Helen. How do you have yours? Answer him, I say. Answer him. This is it. How do you have yours? Well, I won't tell him. If I do, you'll know. You'll know how to do it. So I won't tell him. I won't. The next thing I dreamt, we were home again. Sitting in the parlor. Everything exactly the same, Ernie. Just like tonight before we went to bed. But in my dream, I was sitting paralyzed. In a cold sweat. Waiting for the word. The word from you that meant my death. Oh, well, Butch, I guess we better hit the hay. What do you say? What do you say, darling? No, uh, wait, I, uh, Ernie, did I tell that counterman how I wanted my hamburgers served? Of did course, I... dear. What did I say? I can't seem to remember. Oh, I forget, too. Come along to bed. No, no, I don't want to go to bed yet. Please don't make me go to bed. I'm scared. Helen. <laughs> Come to bed, darling. Like a good little girl. Hmm? We went to bed. And then you said... And now, lights out, eh? I tried to think of everything I knew to keep awake. I wondered whether I ought to count to a hundred or whether counting would put me to sleep. I tried not to count, but I felt myself getting sleepier and sleepier. Sleep, honey? I heard, but I pretended not to. I fought to keep my eyes open. I knew I would die if I closed them. Asleep, Butch? I didn't answer. I couldn't if I wanted to. I was so scared. And then pretty soon I heard you stirring ever so quietly. And in a moment you were leaning over me. Oh, Ernie, I know it was just a dream, but it was so real. And there was hatred in your eyes, and there was a pillow in your hand, and I knew you were going to do it right then, and I... Oh, 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 that's a beaut, that's a honey. Oh, my aching back. Darling, when you have a nightmare, you sure do it up golden brown and creepy. Well, wasn't it crazy? <laughs> Oh, darling, wasn't it mad? Oh, oh, oh wait till I tell it around the office tomorrow. Oh, 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 oh this is too good, kid. But, Ernie, how does a person have a horrible dream like that? What does it mean? Oh, it's a cinch. I'll interpret it for you. And without a dream book, too. Well, go on, then, Ernie. Tell me. Okay, then here it is. First of all, a dream always means the opposite, right? You ever hear that? Yes, I have. That's right, it does. Which means I must love you simply awful. Granted? <laughs> Granted, silly. But, goodness, what about the rest of it? Easiest thing in the world. Darling, where'd we go tonight? To a movie. What kind of a movie? It was a, a murder story. Gee, that's right. Do you think that was... Now, don't interrupt, Butch. Who was starring in the movie? Betty Davis. Repeat the first name. Betty. And the villainous in the dream, my secret love, the girl we met last summer, was also Betty. Betty Daniels. Oh! Well, that gave you Betty on the brain when you went to sleep tonight and movies and murder uh, and those hamburgers you did stop to eat after the show wrapped up the whole sequence. And no wonder, they're still lying on my stomach, too. <laughs> well, what was the pillow doing in it? Sweetness and light, what were you talking about early this evening? That chore you intend to get after someday? Oh, yes, I've got to stuff the pillows. They're caved in the way the feathers have come up. Right, that's your pillow you had on the brain, oh. which uh, which brings me back to the hamburgers. Yes, I was going to ask you, I mean, that nonsense of how did I want my hamburgers, what did all that mean for any place? Precious, how did you order your hamburgers done tonight? Remember? No, I can't recall. Oh, of course you can. Think now. How do you almost always order your hamburgers? I'm smothered in onions. Oh, Ernie, of course. 
smothered in onions. Smother pillow, smother with a pillow. Yes, Jackie. Oh, my heaven sakes alive. Oh, my gosh. So that was it. <laughs> oh, if that doesn't beat. Ernie, that was wonderful. Really. The way you did that figured that all out. I think you'd make a terrific detective. Yeah, so I'm a police reporter. Close enough. <laughs> Darling, it's made me think so. But maybe I have been a little bit selfish. What do you mean? Well, that book you always wanted to write. Maybe I ought to, to let you give up your job and try. Oh, and have us both starve? Nuts. Anyway, in my sane moments, Helen, I've always known the truth. I'm no writer. If I had it in me, it would have come out of me, job or no job. I could go back to work again, you know. I could take up nursing again. It was pretty hard, no, but no, I... No, 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 nonsense. I won't have it. Don't say any more about it, and that's final. You're a swell guy, though, Butch. You're off the case. <sighs> oh, there was one thing more, Ernie. Hmm? Yeah? What do you suppose that was... That was all that about July 15th, about your forgetting July 15th. What did that mean, do you know? Yeah. Don't you? Well, no, I can't. It does seem familiar, but I can't seem to... Where are you going? Get something out of my wallet. Wait a minute. What's the date of our anniversary, Helen? Hmm? Uh, July 15th, of course. Tomorrow. What was that? Right. You've had that on the brain, too. Oh. Here. Little present for you, darling. Well, what on earth? <gasps> Chick. Two railroad tickets to Montreal. Right again. We're taking an anniversary trip. I wanted to surprise you when you woke up, but... Well, anyway, happy anniversary, baby. Oh, Ernie. Oh, you great big precious darling. How can I ever... You didn't forget. You always did before, but this time you did. Oh, Ernie, I just can't stand it. First that dream and then finding out that it did me just the opposite. No, 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 Helen, don't. It's don't. so sweet of you. I'm so thrilled. Montreal, where we had our honeymoon and you haven't forgotten. Oh, Ernie, I I do hope I've been a good wife to you. And if there's anything I ever... I mean, if you want me to, I can always change. Oh, darling, I wouldn't want you any different for the world. I want you to stay just the same sweet little girl I married. And now, let's get some shut-eye, huh? Lights out? All right. And I'm going to put the tickets right here under the pillow. And have a happy dream for a change. <sighs> Good night, Butch. You haven't kissed me? Mm. Good night, dear. Sleep, darling. Darling, are you asleep? Hello? Ernie? You shouldn't have phoned before, Betty. She was still awake. I had to know. Is, is it done? Not yet. You got the tickets? Yes. I know. Is she asleep now? Yes. Just gone off. Then, then what are you waiting for? Nothing. I'll do it now. Right now. As soon as I hang up. Turns on the phone. Then he turns and puts the pillow off his bed. As that clock finishes striking 12. Murder at midnight. 
remember to be with us again when death appears out of the darkness, wearing the face of one you know, and the clock strike twelve for... Murder at Midnight. The part of Helen was played by Elspeth Eric. Walter Vaughn was Ernie. With music by Charles Paul, Murder at Midnight was directed by Anton M. Leader. dead tired, but I kept on walking through the mist, and suddenly I started hearing footsteps behind me. I turned around, and then I saw him. He was walking along slow, dragging his feet, walking as if he couldn't see. His face was all covered with blood, but I know who it was. It was Miller, the guy I killed. Midnight, the witching hour when the night is darkest, our fear is the strongest, and our strength at its lowest ebb. Midnight, when the graves gape open and death strikes. How? You'll learn the answer in just a minute, then. The dead come back. Tales of Mystery and Terror by Radio's Masters of the Macabre. Our story by William Morewood will threaten your sanity. Its title, The Dead Come Back. About one o'clock in the morning, on a dark, deserted street, standing in the doorway of a gloomy brownstone house, a man with a wild expression on his face rings the bell desperately. There is no answer, and he rings again. Then... Hey, Doc Padgett. Why, yes. The brain doc knows what goes on inside a guy's head? Well, yes, I'm a psychiatrist. I've got to talk to you. It's very late. If you come back tomorrow during office hours... Now, Doc. Something's been happening to me. Something that's driving me nuts. I'm sorry, but... Get inside! Be careful with that. It won't go off until I pull a trigger. Sit down, Doc. Very well. Just to make sure we understand each other, I'll put this gun here on the desk and my watch. We got just half an hour to get everything cleared up. And then? And then I got a guy to kill. Suppose we start at the beginning. Your name? Lefty O'Connor. O'Connor? So you heard of me, huh? I'm not sure, but the Tilson murder case. That's right. But as I remember That's it, right. But... He decided I was nuts, put me away. But get this straight, Doc. Yes? I wasn't ever out of my head, and I ain't now. I see. Insanity was something that I cooked up to keep from burning. I played it up all right. Good enough to make monkeys out of the doctors and the jury. But when I got to the nut house, it was different. I didn't have to pretend no more. You know, Doc, some of them wax act just as sane as you and me. Yeah. I was getting along fine. Till two nights ago, when I was called in to see the superintendent. He was a white-haired old guy. Name of Miller. Ah, uh, sit down, Lefty. Cigarette? Thanks, Mr. Miller. Here you are. What's that? This? Just a music box. Plays when you open the lid. That ain't just a... What are you trying to do to me? Oh, what do you mean, Lefty? I just offered you a... That's the box I kept talking about at the trial. The one old Mrs. Tilson kept her jewels in. I'm afraid you're mistaken, Lefty. In a pig's eye. I know what you're trying to do. But I don't remember nothing. 
Nothing, you hear? Then why does this tune seem to disturb you, sir? Never mind why. Turn it off. Yes, of course. Take it easy, Lefty. I called you in here because I want to help you. You're trying to trick me into admitting I knew what I was doing when I hit old lady. Nothing of the kind. Next, you'll be asking me where I hid the jewels. Don't you think I know that routine? There's no routine here, Lefty. You're but... a liar, Mr. Miller. You got me in here to give me the third degree to try to break me down all over again. Well, you won't do it. Not again. I've had enough. Lefty, I... put down that paper uh, so I... <laughs> I didn't have no idea of escaping when I hit him, Doc. I was just scared. I was scared of what would happen if he kept after me. When I found a gun in his desk drawer, I began making plans fast. I brought him around. I told him exactly what he had to do. We went out, got into his car, started for the gate. Okay, Miller, it's up to you now. I understand. Now remember, I'll be lying back here with this gun against your spine. Evening, Mr. Miller. Uh, hello, George. Going out kind of late, aren't you, sir? Uh, yes. Something unexpected came up. <laughs> you wouldn't be smuggling out anyone under that rug and back, sir, huh? I might. <laughs> <laughs> yep, looks suspicious. Just the right shape for a man. But I'll take a chance on you, sir. Okay, Charlie. Open up for the super. Turn the left fork here. Ah, oh, the Ganville Road. I was afraid of this, Lefty. The Tilson Estate's up this way, isn't it? You're too smart for your own good, Mr. Miller. You can turn off here. But there's no road. In under the trees. All right. What happens now? Do we walk the rest of the way? One of us does. Get out. You're no use to me anymore. Let you know. Put that gun away. You can't... You fool. You won't get rid of me this way. You are... I left him there beside his car and started walking. I don't know how long I was at it. Maybe an hour when I hit the outskirts of town. The light was kind of funny. It was different from anything I'd ever seen. It was kind of yellow. Kind of yellow mixed with a mist that was curling up. Maybe I was tired, I don't know. But suddenly I began to hear footsteps behind me. I looked around, and then I saw him. He was walking on the other side of the road, blind, as if he couldn't see where he was going. And his feet were kind of dragging along. His face was covered with blood. But through the blood, I could see that it was him. Miller. I don't know what happened then, Doc. I must have passed out. Because the next thing I knew, somebody... The people, faces bending over me. He's coming too, Tom. Yeah. Hey. How are you feeling, chum? Hey. He's as, as white as if he'd seen a ghost. Who, who are you? I'm Ruth Mason. This is my brother, Tom. We live right by. We heard you yell and came running out. Did did, did, did you see anyone else? I know. No. Road? No. You were lying <laughs> right in the middle of the road till we pulled you off. What happened? Did the car hit you? Yeah, I don't remember. What? Take his arm. Help him up, Tom. Okay, sure. Here we go, Mo. <clears throat> the name is uh, Sims. Johnny Sims. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm all right. <laughs> you look kind of bushed to me. Uh, I, I, I've been walking all night. Uh, out of a job, see. So and broke. Well, our house is right over there. You come on in and we'll oh, fix thanks. it. Thanks. I got to keep moving. What's the rush if you're just looking for a job? Well, I... Uh, hey... Cops coming this way. Probably looking for that man that escaped from the state hospital. That's but, right. They said that. What, Johnny? What's the matter? <laughs> you look as if you're going to fade again. I guess I must be worse than I thought. Look, does that invite still hold? Well, of course. Right this way. So 
something more, Johnny? No, thanks, Ruth. Couldn't manage another thing. Full up. Oh, well, then you lie <laughs> right down on that sofa. That is, if Tom will get off with his paper. <laughs> oh, sure, sure. I was just reading some more about that guy, Lefty O'Connor, that broke out of the asylum. Seems he forced a superintendent to drive him out in a car. Please, Tom. Let's not talk about it. Gives me the creeps to think of anyone like that being loose. Maybe he ain't so bad. He's a murderer, Johnny. A homicidal maniac. How do you know? Maybe the super deserved killing. The super? Yeah. But the paper doesn't say anything about the super being killed. Well, Ruth said... I meant the old lady, Mrs. Tilson. Oh. Yeah, I, I guess I must have heard. Uh, maybe I just thought... I'll try the radio. Maybe there's some late news on it. Well, you're probably right, Johnny. The super wouldn't stand a chance. Sure. The way I figured... What's the matter, Johnny? Turn that off! What? I said turn it off! Why? Johnny! Hey, what gives? Well, I'm sorry. But I... I don't like radios. Oh, it's all right, Johnny. We understand. Now, suppose we show you to your room and you take a good long sleep. I must have slept like a dead man, Doc. It was dark when I woke up. There was nobody in the house. I switched on a lamp and looked at my watch a few minutes before midnight. I didn't have much time if I wanted to get the jewels and blow town before morning. So I started for the door, but before I reached it, it opened. And standing there, smiling, kind of sad-like, was Miller. Hello, Lefty. Did you get the jewels? You! It can't be you. You're dead. I told you you wouldn't get rid of me so easily. What do you want with me? Nothing, Lefty. Just what I wanted before, to help you. You're lying. You still think you can break me, get me to confess, but I'll show you. I must have hit the lights, Doc, or maybe they were never on, because suddenly the room was all dark. I struck a match. I bent down to look at Miller, make sure that he was really dead this time. And I ain't crazy, Doc. you got to believe me. But the man lying face up on the floor was Tom Mason. A dead man who came back. And now, a second victim, as the hands of the clock move inexorably to the witching hour. And yet another... Murder at midnight. <laughs> Now, back to Murder at Midnight. To Lefty O'Connor, sitting in a psychiatrist's office with a gun in front of him, trying to convince the doctor and himself that he is sane. My hand was shaking so much that the match went out. It was Tom, all right. Tom Mason, dead. But it was better that way than what I'd thought, because it meant that Miller hadn't come back from the grave. I'd probably just imagined I heard him talking to me. I frisked Mason, I got the keys to his car, and went out. It was a little coupe parked in the driveway. I opened the door. I was just getting in when... Hello, Johnny. Huh? Ruth. <laughs> you look a little better than you did before. How do you feel? Oh, I, uh, fine, fine. Oh, that's good. You were sleeping so soundly when I left it. Are you going somewhere? Well, yeah, yeah. There was something I had to do, and, uh, Tom told me I could borrow his car. Oh, all right. I'll go inside. No, and... you can't go in there. Well, what do you mean? Why not? Well, I mean, uh, such a swell night. Uh, have a little drive, Ruth. <laughs> but what about your errand? Well, that'll just take a minute. It'll be swell having you along. Well, I don't know. I I don't suppose Tom will mind. But... I'm sure he won't. <laughs> well, then, all right. <sighs> I guess that's one of the wonderful things about life. You just never know when something completely unexpected will happen. <laughs> that's right, baby. You just never know. Why so quiet, Johnny? Huh? 
<laughs> you ask me to come driving with you, and I do, and you don't say a thing to me. What should I be saying? Well, you might start by telling me something about yourself. Like I said, I'm just a guy looking for work. What kind of a job did you have before? Chauffeur. Well, that sounds interesting. Did you work around here? Why? I just wondered. You seem to know the roads so well. Listen, baby, let's not talk about me. I'd rather hear about you. Well, there's not much to tell. I'm 21, fancy free, and I work for a living. I'm a nurse in a psychiatrist's office. A what? A psychiatrist. A doctor who, well, helps people who are disturbed mentally. Like people who, uh, see things that ain't there? Oh, yes. He gets a lot of those kind of cases. What does he do? Mm, talks to the patients, explains away the hallucination. His name is Dr. Paget, and he's really wonderful. Johnny. Yeah? Where are we going? Why, baby? We've turned off the main road. This leads past the old Tilson mansion. What's that? The house where that terrible murder took place about a year ago. It's all boarded up now, of course. Yeah, but... yeah, that's the job Lefty O'Connor pulled, yes. huh? Yes. Yeah, he was old Mrs. Tilson's chauffeur. What? Chauffeur. Quite a coincidence, ain't it? Johnny, you're turning in the driveway. Yeah. See, a couple of nights ago, I broke into this place to sleep. It was just an empty house to me. I didn't know anything about no murder. I left the parcel behind. I want to pick it up. Oh, Oh, I, I see. You think I had any other reason for coming here? No, Johnny. Sit tight, baby. I'll be back in a minute. All right. All right, Johnny. I... Well, why are you taking the keys? Just to make sure the car stays here and you with it. But of course I'll stay. You better, baby. Or it'll be just too bad. I pulled the board loose from one of the windows. Climbed into the old house. It was black as pitch inside. That musty, shut-in smell. I felt my way along the wall to the stairs. Climbed to the second floor. The old lady's room was at the head of the stairs. It wasn't so dark in there. The windows hadn't been boarded and the moonlight was coming in. And I saw that marble fireplace with a gargoyle in the middle grinning at me. So I picked up the poker and smashed into it. And there, behind where I pushed it past a loose brick, was a paper bag containing the jewels. I looked inside to make sure that everything was safe. Moonlight sparkled on them shiners. And then, then Doc, suddenly, suddenly out of nowhere it started. That music started. Johnny, stop it! Stop it! Johnny, stop where it. are you? What? Who? Oh, Ruth! Get it a stop. Get it a stop. Get it, Mr. Mrs. Tilson, that tune. What tune? You mean you don't hear nothing? Well, no, Johnny. But you must. It's gone now. Johnny, you're shaking all over your... Johnny, what's that? What's what? Well, they're all over the floor. They look like diamonds, jewels. Didn't I tell you to stay in the car? What are you doing up here? I, I heard noises and you You yelled. were spying on me. No, I wasn't, Lefty. I... What did you call me? Nothing, I... So you guessed it, huh? Okay. I am left to your corner, and I came back for the jewels. But that information ain't traveling far. Mm-hmm. Not with you, anyway. What do you mean? I... No! No! Oh, yeah! Oh, yeah! was rattled, Doc. The music did it. That and everything else. I left the lion there and I picked up the jewels and beat it. I started the car fast. I just about hit the main highway when the wheels started acting funny. I stopped and got out to look. It was a flat. My luck had played out. If I took the time to change it, someone might come along. And just then I did hear a car coming. I, I froze, waiting for it to pass. Instead, it stopped, and... Hi, Johnny. Tom. Tom, miss. I got out as soon as I could. Which is the flat? What? How did you know? How did I know? Why, you just called me. You told me you couldn't find the tools. I called you? Why, yeah. Don't you remember? 
No, no, I don't. I couldn't have. I, 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 I... Of course, it's none of my business, Johnny, but... Look, you've been acting awful funny. I'm beginning to think maybe you ought to go see a doctor. Someone like Doc Patchett that Ruth works for. There's nothing wrong with me. Nothing. Okay. Okay. Get started with this, Jack. The rest of the tools are under the front seat. I'll get them. No, no, wait. What's this paper bag doing? Give me that! (laughs) You're calling in for pebble collecting, huh? Pebbles? Yeah, look at them. Oh, they are pebbles. eh? Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) What's happening to me? Oh. I don't know. (laughs) But I told you, you don't look well. (laughs) Hey, where are you going? Hey, what? Wait a minute, I told you that was a borrowed car. Get off that round, yeah. boy. I say get off. You're nuts, Johnny. You're nuts. You're crazy. Well, there it is, Doc. Yeah, huh? That's his story. I kept hearing what he said. Tom, over and over again. I'm nuts. I'm crazy. But I couldn't stand it anymore. So I looked you up in the phone book and I come over. Well, what do you expect me to do, Lefty? Do? You're a brain doc. I'm not nuts. I know I'm not. Why am I seeing these things? What's happening to me? Well, it's rather difficult to make a diagnosis this quickly, but uh, I'd say that you were suffering from hallucinations because of a sense of guilt. Guilt? About what? Well, it probably started with that first murder, Mrs. Tilson. And it's been weighing, preying on your mind ever since. Now, if you could extrovert that, get it out of your system. But I, I did. Uh, that's true, but not as a confession, with all the details. That's the only way you can achieve a complete catharsis. Well, that's crazy. All right. You wanted my advice, but you don't have to take it. And you think... Okay. Okay, I did kill her. I knew all the time what I was doing. I waited for a night when there was only the two of us in the house, and then I beat her brains out with a tire iron. There. There, I said it, I told you. Yes, Lefty. And I think that now I can promise you you'll never be troubled by hallucinations again. You sure, Doc? Quite sure. That's good. Because, remember I said that in half an hour I was going to kill someone? Yes. Well, a half hour is up. And you're the man. Am I, Lefty? Yeah. I'm sorry, Doc, but you know too much now. You're the only one who does, so... I wouldn't, Lefty. Why, why are you sitting there like that? I shot you. Yes, Lefty, with blanks in your gun. All right, boy. Take it easy, Lefty. We got you covered. Miller. And Mason. Did you get it? Uh Uh-huh. Every word. You're cops. No kidding. Then the whole thing, letting me escape and everything that happened afterwards was just a trick. That's right. You wanted to show I wasn't nuts, get me to confess. Smart boy. You made just one mistake, Lefty. Or rather, Ruth did. Following you into the Tilson mansion. She paid for that with her life. But now, now you're going to pay. No, no. Shut up. Yes, Lefty, for that and for the Tilson murder. And my only regret is that rats like you can only burn once. Moving forward, the two grim-faced men take hold of Lefty O'Connor... And Lefty knows that he's come to the end of the road. The road that began when he first heard the clock from the old Tilson mansion strike 12 for... Murder! At midnight!
remember to be with us again when death's face peers out of the darkened windows of deserted houses and the clocks strike twelve for murder at midnight. <laughs> The part of Lefty O'Connor was played by Joseph Julian. With music by Charles Paul, Murder at Midnight was directed by Anton M. Leader. Just a minute in Terror Out of Space. And now, Murder at Midnight. Tales of Mystery and Terror by radio's Masters of the Macabre. Our story, which we prophesy will be long remembered as a classic, is by Robert Newman. A tale out of the news and out of man's deepest fears called Terror Out of Space. I sat up in bed, straining my ears, listening. The surf was rolling and pounding on the beach at the foot of the cliff. One of the dynamos was purring away next door in the experimentation shack. And that was all. Had I really heard anything? Or had I just imagined it, dreamed it? I didn't know. All I knew was that I was in a cold sweat, shivering even though it was a hot summer's night. But that wasn't surprising after what had happened. Just what had happened? Maybe I could get it all straight, fill in the gaps that had been bothering me if I went back over it again from the beginning. I hadn't wanted to before this. I'd fought against even thinking about it. But now, now it was as if something was making me think about it. That's right, John. Start way back in the beginning. Then maybe you will wake up. Start to. Do start to. 
Nothing was the beginning. When they assigned me here, I guess, miles from anywhere on the Jersey coast. I knew it was some kind of hush-hush project, and I'd been in the Army long enough not to ask questions. I had some ideas, though, and when I walked into administration and found Professor Martell there, I was pretty sure they were right. Lieutenant Larkin reporting for duty, sir. Hello, John. How are you? Fine, Professor. Uh, I mean, Major. Well, let's forget the Major. <laughs> I've been trying to. <laughs> I think the Army's a little sorry about the whole thing also. Well, that's not the way I heard it. Some of the things you've worked out in the last few years was something. Quite a break my getting assigned here. <laughs> you think it was an accident? You, you mean you requested me? Of course. What did I take you away from, by the way? Oh, nothing very much. Straight communications, a little radar. Mm. No chance to continue any of the research you started when you were at the university, huh? No. Afraid I've gotten rusty? Not really. But there are just going to be the three of us to do the bulk of the work. You, myself, and a chap named Roy Shields. He worked with Ramsey at Tech. And what's the project? Something big? I think so. We're going to try and establish radio contact with the moon. Theoretically, it shouldn't be too difficult, you know. Of course. It, and with the progress we've made during the war, we, the professor, it's terrific. One of the most exciting things I've ever heard of. <laughs> Think so? Well, don't you? Don't you remember when we used to talk about it in the lab? What it would mean to the astronomers, the astrophysicists, measurements that they'd never <laughs> even be, been able to take before. Yes, John, I remember. Well, then? I don't know. Somehow it... Well, it worries me. How we're going to do it? No, that's all cut and dry. What's going to happen when we do do it? What do you mean? We're reaching out, John. Reaching out into places where man has never been before. We're pretty close to the secret of matter, to the origin of life, and to the mystery of the universe. Sometimes, sometimes I become a little afraid. Afraid that we may stumble on something that's too much for us, too big. And... <laughs> but that's silly. Go pick out a bunk and get some rest, John. Tomorrow, we'll go to work. The work, I remember that all right, weeks of it. And finally, the big night, the night we were ready for our first test. It was clear and cool, the ocean still, not thundering, but whispering at the base of the cliffs, as if it were waiting. Every star separate and distinct, like signposts on the road to the infinite. Martell at the table in the center of the laboratory, with the charts and diagrams doing the computing. Roy at the power controls, and I at the director. Time, 23.02. 15 seconds. Power, 10.12. Check. You reading, John? 93 degrees. Make it plus 0.2. Check. Time, 23.02, 10. Power on. Three seconds. Four. Now. How long to wait? We should get it almost immediately. Lag of not more than... There! Listen! Huh? That's it! That's it! We've done it! We're in contact with the moon! Yes, we've done it. Reached out into space and done it. For the first time since man had walked erect, we had established contact with another heavenly body. Bridged the infinite with man-made electrical impulses. There was no work done during the next two days, just excitement. Public relations broke the story the next morning, and we were swamped. Newspaper reporters, photographers, interviews, commentaries, prophecies. Finally, we got back to normal. And a couple of nights later... Yes. It's starting to come back to me now. I remember. I remember. It was the sound of the generators that woke me. I looked at my watch, almost midnight. Roy was asleep in his bunk, and I didn't wake him. I padded out along the duck boards to the laboratory. The lights were on. I went in, and there was Professor Martell. He was sitting at the control table, and he was... Well, he was funny. His eyes were open, but he didn't seem to see me. I said, Hello, Professor. He didn't move. He didn't answer. I took a quick look at the control board, and the frequency had been changed. A little uneasy, I, I tried again. Professor, what are you doing? And then, then something very strange happened. Half of him came alive. His right side first, 
His right eye lighting up while his left eye stayed dead. His right hand twitched while his left one remained stiff. It was just for a fraction of a second. Then... What? Oh. Hello, John. Hello, Professor. Anything the matter? Matter? What am I doing in here? I don't know, sir. I heard the generators go on, and I came in and found you here. Strange. Very strange. I went to bed about 10.30. Ever walked in your sleep before? No, not that I know of. Of course, I haven't been sleeping too well lately. Very disturbing dream. Did you change the transmitter frequency that way? Uh, no, sir. You must have done it yourself in your sleep. Funny. That would make it more of a carrier instead of a transmitter wave. Uh, shall I shift it back? No, leave it. I'd like to take a look again in the morning. Do some thinking about it. The next morning, somehow... Neither of us mentioned it. I can't be sure now whether we didn't remember or just didn't think it was important. But that night... Yes. Yes, it was that night that we discovered what it meant. That we knew... It was the sound of the generators that woke me again. I looked at my watch a few minutes before midnight. And it was then that I noticed that Roy wasn't in his bunk. I lay there. And for some reason I was terrified, trembling... There was something in the air, a feeling of, a feeling of menace that... I made myself get up. I slipped on a pair of sneakers and went out along the duck walk to the laboratory. The lights were on again. I didn't go in this time, but, but I looked in the window. There was Roy, and there was Professor Martell again. He was sitting at the control table with that... that same dead look on his face. And Roy was standing in front of him, talking to him. I could hear him through the window. What is it, sir? What's going on? Is anything the matter? In his sleep. Walking in his sleep. I better get Larkin and... Oh, I can't leave the generator on, though. Got to shut that off first. He turned and started to walk across the room toward the master switch. And as he turned, Martell moved. His face stayed dead, expressionless, but he moved. He got up without a sound took a heavy wrench from the work table and followed Roy. And then, just as Roy put out his hand to throw the switch, he hit him. No! I heard his skull go like the shell of a rotten pumpkin, and he went down, dead. I, I couldn't move. I couldn't make a sound. I just stood there, frozen with horror. Martell looked down at him without batting an eye. And then, like a zombie, he walked over to the bench, picked up a hacksaw and went back. And then... Bending over Roy's body, he started cutting off the top of his head. A voice from the void, from the midnight waking. Memories, things best forgotten, coming back again. Memories of the terror that came out of space and of murder at midnight. Midnight and Terror Out of Space. That was, that's all I remembered then. When Professor Martell bent over Roy's body with a hacksaw in his hand, he must have fainted. When I opened my eyes, I was lying on the sand outside the shack, and there was Martell bending over me. No, Professor, no, no, don't, my don't. John. What's the matter? Leave me alone. Don't come near me. Don't touch me. I saw what you did in there. In where? Where? Just now in the shack to Roy. Aren't you well either, John? What? What do you mean? I just came up here from the cottage. I had a bad dream. I've been having quite a few of them lately, and I woke up with a very annoying headache. I came out to take a walk, get some air. I found you lying but, there. But I, I'm telling you, I saw you. I saw you in there with Roy and... And what? Well, I don't even want to think about it. But you killed him. Killed him? Huh. Let's go back to the bunkhouse, John. Take a look. 
The bunkhouse? Yes, when you see that Roy is where we should be in bed, maybe it'll convince you that you either dreamed or imagined the whole thing. He led the way to the bunkhouse, and I followed. Still shaken, but starting to feel a little foolish. This was the Professor Martell I had studied under, known for years, the man who wouldn't hurt a fly. We went into the bunkhouse, and Roy's bed was empty. He wasn't there. Martell gave me a funny look and started calling. Roy! Roy, where are you? Roy! Without a word, we hurried back to the laboratory, and there was no sign of him there either. Nothing. Wait, he, he must have gone out for a walk too, Professor, or maybe jeeped into town. If it was true, there'd be something here, his body, blood... There, John. Well, right there, in front of the switch. But there's nothing there. No. Except that it looks as if this floor was just scrubbed. The floor... You're right. John. Huh? Did you change the transmitter frequency this way? But no, sir. You must have done it. Just the way you did last night. Last night? You mean something happened last night, too? You don't remember? No. Tell me what you saw happen tonight. Everything you remember, whether you believe it now or not. Well, it was... It was pretty terrible, Professor. We were sitting there. And then, as quietly as, it, as if he were a laboratory specimen, you took a hacksaw and started to cut off the top of his head. Mercy. Heavens. Talking to you now, I know the whole thing's mad, impossible, but... Yes. Mad impossible, but... You... You mean it could have happened some way without your knowing it? Sit down, John. Relax. Tell me what you know about the moon. Huh? The moon is a satellite. Stellar body, probably formed by our sun in an encounter with some other stellar body. Yes, yes, probably formed at the same time as the Earth. But it may very well have supported life long before there was life here. Life. But we know what its atmosphere yes, is. We know what it is now. But how do we know what it was a million, several million years ago? Suppose, just suppose, that there was life there millions of years ago. Life that reached a level of development we cannot even imagine. Suppose it died out as a form of life that we could recognize, but remained in a form that is eternal. What do you mean? In the form of electrical energy. We know that thought is an electrical process. An electrocephalograph will give a definite reading when a man is thinking. Yes. Suppose intelligences continue to exist on the moon in the form of complex electric charges. And suppose a channel is suddenly opened between the moon and some other planet. The beams we sent out are our radar beams. You mean they, they could come down, down the beam, take hold of someone, you, and make you... I'm supposing, John, hypothesize. The fact is that the transmitter was set at carrier frequency, and none of us did it consciously. Of course, even if it's true, we have no way of knowing whether these entities are dangerous, malevolent or not. No way of knowing, but, but they killed. They made you kill. Made you kill Roy. Because he was going to shut off the transmitter, cut off contact with the plate they came from. As for the rest, well, they would be intensely curious about the human body, particularly the brain. They would want to examine it. Anna. Good Lord, Professor, do you realize what you're saying? The taking over of a person's body? Yes, John, I do realize what I'm saying. Well, I don't believe it myself. Have you a gun? Uh, why, well, yes. Yes, I never carry it. Well, start carrying it. And if you notice me doing anything strange, incomprehensible, don't hesitate. Shoot. I didn't sleep that night. I remember that now. And I was convinced that I would never sleep again. Because it was there then, the moon. It was there all the time, of course, day and night. But it was during the night when I was asleep that it would be easiest for them, that they might try and... and... <laughs> no, I can't think about it. I won't even now. <sighs> With the daylight, I felt a little better. Roy hadn't come back, but, well, there were a dozen possible explanations for that. I went to have another talk with Professor Martell. And he was gone, too. His bed was empty, as if it had never been slept in. I waited until about noon. Then I called headquarters. 
had decided that I was going to tell them only facts, things I could believe myself. Hello? Hello, Colonel. This is Larkin over at Radar Experimental. Oh, yes, Larkin. How are you? Uh, pretty good, sir. Uh, I I'd like to report that both Sergeant Shields and Major Martell are missing. Huh? Missing? What do you mean? I don't know, sir. They were both gone when I got up this morning. Oh, no, sir, I, I couldn't. Not right now. Okay. Then you carry on until they get back, and then I'll arrange for you to do it uh, officially. So I stayed. Stayed there in the lonely shack on top of the cliff, alone. And that was the most awful, terrible week of my life. Only the wind, the pounding of the surf, and my fears, fears that were with me constantly. There was work I had to do, but... I had to force myself to go into the laboratory. Then, on Friday, they found Roy's body. A phone call took me to town to the local funeral parlor. When I got there, the colonel was waiting. Um, you knew Sergeant Shields pretty well, didn't you, Larkin? Yes, sir. Uh, some fishermen found a body in their nets this morning. I uh, wish you'd look at it. Of course, sir. Uh, right here. Evidently, the fish were pretty hungry. Well, no one could be sure, sir, but I think that is Shields. All right, Larkin. Thank you. Yes, they found Roy's body. And that night, Martell came back. I'd taken something to make me sleep. It was the only way I could sleep. But the sound of the generators woke me again. I lay there listening, unbelieving but terrified because there was no one at the station but me. Then, picking up my gun, I went down the duck walk to the laboratory. I opened the door, and there he was, Professor Martell. His face was thin, haggard. His eyes were dead, lackluster, the way they'd been those other two nights. And when he spoke, his voice was hardly human, as if someone was using him, speaking through him. Too bad that you woke up, Larkin. You should not have come in here. What do you mean, Professor? Where have you been? We have been looking over your planet, studying it. Very interesting. And now we are ready to go. Go? Go where? What are you talking about? What? What? Are you... you... You said we. Professor Martell, have, have they... Just a few preparations to make. And then... Then... Voice, that horrible voice stopped, and Martell swayed as if he were going to fall. Oh. I grabbed him, and he opened his eyes. He was himself again, and when he spoke, it was with his own voice. John, John, for heaven's sake, help me, help me. How, Professor? How? Look, I'm what I told you. Don't you remember? Don't you understand? They got me. They took me that night. Took me all over the country, looking, examining, studying. They picked my brain. They sucked me dry. And now, now they're going to take me back with them. Back with them? Back to where they came from. Not my body, they're not interested in that. But the essential me, the, the... It have its name, shoot, John, shoot and... And now we are ready. They had him again. As your friend told you, we are taking him with us. But you, you will not remember. You will remember nothing, do you understand? Because someday... We may come back. I stood there, frozen, still holding on to Martell. Like a sleepwalker with superhuman strength, he pushed me away. I staggered back against the wall. Stiffly and mechanically, he walked to the door, opened it, and went out. The surf was thundering, the wind blowing straight to the edge of the cliff he walked, and then went over. But before he fell... He seemed almost to hover for a moment, as if something in him was going not down, but up. Now, do you remember, John? Now, do you remember? You've got to remember. You've got to. I tricked them. Fooled them. That's how I was able to get through to you. But they'll be coming for me any minute. And... John, you've got to do something. You've got to. It's true. They do exist. And they've got me here. They may be coming back again. 
I found this all written out on the pad I keep next to my bed. Written out in my own handwriting, but a little scrawled and jerky as if my hand wasn't quite steady. Some of it I remember. Other parts, like Roy's murder, Professor Martell's suicide, I don't recall at all. Either I'm mad, completely mad, or... No, I can't think about it. I mustn't. Anyway, if I showed this to anyone, the world would think I'm mad. So now I'm going to burn it. Burn it up completely. White and shaking, John Larkin tears the scrawled pages from his notebook, crumples them into an ashtray, and puts a match to them. And thus there disappears into ashes the only remaining evidence of the terror from out of space and of murder at midnight. Remember to be with us again when death comes in some unknown form. The clocks strike 12 for murder at midnight. The part of John Larkin was played by George Petrie, and Peter Capel was Professor Martell. With music by Charles Paul, Murder at Midnight was directed by Anton M. Leader. Like a madman. He wants to kill me. Someone does. Like the other three, lying on the floor in a pool of blood. Almost twelve o'clock. Midnight. Any minute now, there'll be a ring. Or a knock. <laughs> Midnight. The witching hour when the night is darkest. Our fears the strongest. And our strength at its lowest ebb. Midnight, when the graves gape open and death strikes. How? You'll learn the answer in just a minute in... The Creeper. at midnight. On this program, we bring you the best and most blood-curdling stories ever written. And so now we bring you a tale which you may have heard before, a tale which we consider a classic in terror and suspense, The Creeper by Joseph Ruskall. In the kitchenette of the New York apartment, a man and his wife listened to the evening news broadcast. New York. The unknown killer called the Creeper has struck again, adding a third female corpse to his toll. Mm. Virginia Peters, a comely waitress, was found strangled to death in her third floor apartment early this morning while her radio blared. As in the previous murders, a note was found scrawled on the wall with the victim's lipstick and the plea, for heaven's sake, 
catch me before I kill more. I cannot control myself. Oh. Police insist. Now, why'd you turn it off? Oh, how awful. Oh, and then this very neighbor. Let's hear the rest. It's very interesting. Oh, you... Don't go turning that radio on again, Steve Grant. Heard enough, I'll go out of my mind, for heaven's sake. That's it. A good, solid clue. What is? For heaven's sake. How many men ever use that expression? Oh, shut up. Okay, Mrs. Grant, pass the biscuits, my little pigeon. Pass the biscuits, E-D-D. Three women in three days murdered in cold blood by a mad fiend right here in Washington Heights. I'm too sick to go out, too scared to stay in. The lock's broke. He sits there eating, 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 past the biscuits. There's nothing wrong with my appetite, my love. Of course. That's what costs you your job on the police force. When I even think of Some it. men drink to escape. I eat. Escape what? What? An ugly tongue, a beautiful face, and a roving eye. In short, a wife. So you're starting that again, you and your crazy jealousy. Yeah, maybe that's the creeper's way of escaping, too, Georgia. Who knows? Shut up. Go ahead and get a divorce. Go ahead. Can I help it if men look at me? Uh. I don't know why you come home at all. Where do you go? What do you do with yourself? Where were you this morning? Why'd you come back? To eat. But someday I'll lose my appetite for that, too. And when I do, my dear, there'll be no escape. And now I'm off again. Kiss. Still using stage lipstick. Wipe it off. How many times must I tell you? You're married now, remember? Steve, wait. Yeah? At least go buy my medicine. Sorry, I got no time. Don't leave me here alone. Stay home this evening. Please, I'm afraid. Oh, don't be silly, pet. Nothing will happen to you. You got a doorman here, an elevator boy, Mrs. Stone across the hall, a phone. You're safe enough. But the night lock, it doesn't work. Oh, now you can't lock me out anymore. It doesn't catch. Something's happened to it since last night. Steve. Get a new one. I can't get a locksmith. I've tried all day. Steve, please. If I want to phone you, where will you be? Out. Goodbye. Take care of your cold. <laughs> Steve Grant. Huh? Well, if it isn't old Pearly Chase, how are you? Here you got thrown off the force, Steve. Yeah, I hear you got thrown off the news, Pearlie. You heard wrong. I wasn't fired. I was just warned. I wasn't fired either. Just suspended for three days. Eating a lamb chop at Casey's when I should have been ringing in from the box at 162nd with all that trouble up there. On my way to headquarters now for reinstatement. I eat too much, my trouble is. I drink too much. Here you're living up at the Heights, Steve. Yeah. That's funny, me too. Yeah. Here you're married now to a beautiful and lovely young... <whistles> ...with admiration. <laughs> Say it again. I think I knew her. Wasn't her stage name Georgia Dixon? Yeah, that's her. I uh, love that wench, but... the uh, women. How does a guy handle them? You know, maybe the creeper has the right method. <laughs> Thank you for taking the words out of my mouth. Who's the creeper, Steve? Any angles? You tell me and I'll split the reward with you. <laughs> <laughs> Say, what do you think of Inspector Bradley's inside job yeah, theory? Nuts. Every janitor's a creeper? And as for that doorman, Jim Ellis, just because he worked at two of the three murder apartments? Pure coincidence. Anyway, they've released him. One thing, though, and I don't think even Bradley's put it together yet. Yeah? In all three cases, just before the creeper struck, the door locks had already been tampered with. You don't say. You got a theory? Well, sure. I mean, uh, you take that note on the wall. For heaven's sake, in every case, for heaven's sake, catch me before I kill more. I cannot control myself. Right. Oh. Now, what man uses an expression like that? You want the lowdown? It's just this. A creeper is a woman. <laughs> a gimmick, huh? Yeah. Like the height of the message from the floor is a trick, six feet. And yet I'll lay odds the creeper's no more than a guy your height, say, or mine. Five nine, just like us, you or me. Only crazy. Yeah. How do you figure that? How do I figure lots of things? How do I know where the creeper's gonna strike next? You do? Certainly. Creeper is not so smart. He's just crazy. You'll play along crazy and you're one jump ahead of him. 
That's the trouble with Inspector Bradley, why he's up a tree. You expect logical clues from a madman? You play along crazy, make out you're the creeper. And what do you get? Go ahead, let's see. All right, the victims are all redheads, every one. You've noticed that, of course. Three in three days? Yeah, now that you mention it. They all lived in the Heights, right? Agnes Martin, Jane Krutsky, Virginia Peters? Right. What was the number of the apartment in each case? Agnes lived in 1A, Jane 2B, Virginia 3C. Don't ask me the why or wherefore. Don't ask me the logic. Just play along crazy. See what I mean? Where's he going to strike next? Huh? I don't catch you. The next victim of the creeper also lives in the Heights. She's a redhead. Her night lock's been tampered with. She's going to get hers today, and her apartment number's 4D. Well, why are you looking at me? Don't you like my arithmetic? Pearly, my wife's a redhead. We live in the Heights. And our apartment number is... <laughs> You're just a boozy reporter. Your apartment number? 4D, I told you. 4D, of course. It's pretty late, but I'll have it delivered. I was busy admiring your lipstick, Mrs. Grant. I've nothing like it in stock. 4D, I should have guessed it anyway. Why? Well, a face is a number. Believe me, since you've moved into the neighborhood, Mrs. Grant... For me, it has a special number, like uh, Double Dandy Delicious Dream. <laughs> Four Ds, you see? Oh, go on. But you tell that to every customer, female. I'm a ladies' man? Like the creeper? <gasps> what did I say? What's going on in this block? Raw nerves, you can't joke. The creeper, the oh. creeper, that's all I hear all day. It's mass hysteria. There ain't such an animal. You... You don't think so? I assure you, Mrs. Grant, it's a fairy tale for circulation of the tabloids. I'll send you a prescription up with the boy. No, uh, no I'll, I'll, I'll just wait here for it. Well, it'll take some time. You should go right home and stay there if you're just getting over the flu. I'll tell you what. I'll deliver it myself. It'll be a pleasure. No, 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 no. I'll, I'll wait. I, I may not go right back. I don't want to... I don't want to be there alone. I'm afraid. Very well. Suit yourself. Uh, have a seat. For heaven's sake, stop me before I kill more. What? I cannot control my... Wait! I was only joking, Mrs. Grant. Wait, Mrs. Grant, your prescription. Why, yes. What's your hurry, dear? I just got such a scare. I sense these awful murders in this neighborhood. Yes, isn't it terrible? Oh. I'm simply frightened to death myself. You walking home? Yeah, I guess so. Well, I'll go with you. It's good we live in the same house. At least if I had a double lock, but the night one doesn't work. Oh, really? Well, I have a chain lock besides, and still oh, it I'm... is. I sit and shiver when there's a sound at the door. Can't get a locksmith. Tried all day, but they're all so busy. Mr. Frank on the corner promised to, but didn't know when. Why are they all so busy? Well, my dear, because every woman in the neighborhood's changing theirs, too. Simply a nightmare. Oh, but don't you worry. We'll stay together this evening. Mr. Stone's out, too. Think of it, we've never visited, though we live right across the hall from each other. Isn't that like a big city, for heaven's sake? Or would you rather I dropped in on you? Well, uh, I, I don't well, know. Well, make it your it... place, then. Isn't it horrible, the ghastly things they're saying? The theories one doesn't know what to think next. You believe the latest? The latest? That maybe it's a woman, the creeper... <gasps> A woman? Can you beat it? I just can't imagine how in the world the police figure that, for heaven's sakes. Can you? I say, can you, Miss Grant? Oh, uh, I don't know. I was just thinking of something my husband Though said. I can see where a married woman now, if her husband was faithless, well, I can understand such a theory because they take my husband now. Uh, you've met Mr. Stone, haven't you? Well, Mrs. Grant, why on earth are you staring at me like that, for heaven's sakes? Oh, uh, I... Don't feel well. I must get home. I uh, feel faint. But Mrs. Grant, feel for heaven's sake. Sobbing with terror, the woman with red hair runs up the dark street, back to her apartment on the door with the broken lock. As the hands of the clock move on towards 12 o'clock and... Murder at midnight.
And now, back to Murder at Midnight and The Creeper. Back to Georgia Grant, hurrying hysterically through the dark streets towards the apartment with the broken lock on the door. Good evening, ma'am. Oh. Out late, aren't you? Oh, yeah, you're the uh, new doorman? Just relieving Charlie. Nice night. Yeah, yeah it was very nice. Here, uh, let me ring the elevator for you. No, you don't have to trouble. No trouble, ma'am. There. Apartment 4D, huh? Oh. Yeah. How did you know? Doesn't take long. When will this elevator come? Coming now. Terrible things, ma'am. The happenings. What? The creeper. It's sort of... Oh. Going up? Yeah, yeah. Up and down, up and down. The ups and downs of life, that's me. I'm a living milkshake, Mrs. Grant. Uh-oh. What's wrong, Jimmy? Stuck. Imagine getting stuck between a third and fourth with a production like you. Get going, Sonny. You want me to report you? Okay, okay. Can't you take a joke? <laughs> Maybe I misconstrued that smile you always give me. Maybe you shouldn't order to smile that way. Fourth floor. Let me out. If I drop in later, will you be more receptive? <laughs> oh, home. Oh, thank goodness. I must be going out of my mind. Key. Where's my key? Darn this lock. Darn the lock. Hello. Is the locksmith in yet? Well, I want to know how soon I can get my lock changed. Yes, I know it's late, but he promised. This is Mrs. Grant. Yes, 4D, yes. I know you just explained to me, but Hello, I must... Georgia. Yes? Yes, so, so won't you... I've please? been waiting for you. Oh, oh, don't you little fool. It's oh, me. Do you want oh, the whole house to... Oh. It's better. What are you doing here? Oh, don't worry. You haven't got a thing to worry about now. I've come to protect you. Give me the phone. Hello? Never mind about the lock, thank you. Sit down. Make yourself at home. Been waiting here for you. Long time no see, Georgia. What do you want, Pearlie? Me? A headline. Your husband wants to... He wants I should keep an eye on you. What's that? Sure. You didn't think Steve and I were acquainted, did you? Oh, yes. From way back. Just met him at a bar. I don't believe you. What do you mean, keep an eye on me? Oh, just in case the creep... <gasps> oh. <laughs> oh. You heard of the character? You're mad. You've always been mad, Pearly Chase. Where is Steve? Why should he send you here? Why should he think the creeper will come here? What are you doing here? Told you. Playing along crazy. Got a drink? You're drunk now. And you're getting right out of here. You're nothing but a no-good rummy. And you're nothing but a no-good... You finish it. When I took the drink, it was to drown you out. And you know it. I'm still a rum pot, Angel... Which means I haven't got rid of you yet. Get out. You little two-timing redhead. You're all the same, you redheads. Even a wedding ring you can't change you. Oh, red. don't play the innocent. My business is snooping. I make a living at it between drinks. So your new motto's love thy neighbor, huh? Mr. Stone across the hall? Poor dumb Steve. I'm warning you. Get out or I'll call the police. Stay where you are. All right, Pearlie. What are you doing with that gun? I wouldn't pick up that phone if I were you. You see, there's a big reward for the creeper and a heck of an exclusive, and I don't want to share it. I'm riding a hunch. Now, sit down, darling. Just 
play along with me while I play along crazy. Sit down. That's it. Like we're expecting company. <laughs> let's have some music. Don't just sit. Let's have some music. I said turn on the radio. That's it. That's the good girl. Ah, dance music. Ah, let's dance. Give me your arm. Let's dance. Old times. Around and around like my brain. Why are you trembling? I still love you, you little fool. Ask me why. I love you. I love you, you lovely redhead. I could kill you and you deserve it. With the radio on, you could scream and no one would hear. I could put my hand on your throat like this and I could strangle you. <laughs> Why are you crying? Stop it. I'm here to protect you. Stop crying. Cut it, I said. Cut it out. I can't stand it. I never could. Okay. You want me to leave? All right, I will. It's your funeral. What am I saving you for anyway? Where's my hat? In a few minutes, there'll be a knock or a ring or the door will just open. And you'll be lying in a pool of... Blood, like the other three. Goodbye, my worthless. Give my regards to the creeper. What if he comes back? He wants to kill me. Wants to kill me. Somebody wants to kill me. I must lie down. My head is splitting. Trying to frighten me. Still a spite, that's it. Like the other three. In a pool of blood. Like the other three, like the other three. Almost. Almost twelve o'clock. Any minute now, there'll be a knock. Or a ring. <laughs> Yes? This is the doorman, Mrs. Grant. Yes? The druggist is here with a medicine. Shall I let him up? A medicine? Uh, yes, let it. No, 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 no. Don't let that man up. Want me to bring it up? No, 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 no. I'm perfectly all right. I don't need any. I don't need it, you hear? Don't you dare come up. Don't let him. Please, please, I must have it changed right away. My lock, my door lock. Yes, this is Mrs. Grant. Yes, I do want it. Of course, anyone can get in, anyone. They want to murder me, but I don't know who. It's the creeper. Oh, you'll come right away? Thank you, thank you. Thank you so much, but hurry. Please hurry or I'll go out of my mind. Thank the Lord. Like the other three in a pool of blood. Any minute now, a knock or a ring. Oh. Who? Who's there? It's me, dear, Mrs. Stone. Oh, what do you want? Well, I've been worried about you. Are you ill? No, I'm all right, Mrs. Stone. I'm feeling fine. Open up, dear. Don't you want me to keep you company? No, 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 thank you. I, I was just... Oh, stop that. Do let me in, silly and weird. No, no, please, go away. I'm going to sleep. Go away. You hear me? Go away. Uh, hello. Hello, George. Are you oh. all right? Oh, Steve. Steve, I've been frantic. So good to hear your voice. Where are you? At headquarters. I'm coming right home. Sweetheart, is anything wrong? You said No, so. no, no, not now. Not when I hear you, Steve. I don't know what came over me all day. I've been imagining things so silly. My nerves. I'm sorry about supper tonight, honey. I wasn't myself. My job had me down, but now everything's Oh, of okay. course. Forgive me, Steve. I've been bad, bad, wicked. 
Oh, darling, if you knew what I've gone through tonight, the most dreadful state. And then that... Steve, did you send someone here today? Curly Chase? Then you did? Yeah, to keep you company. Isn't he still with you? No, I just got rid of him. Oh, I wish you hadn't. He's an all right guy. Smart reporter. Lives in the neighborhood, too. Honey, it sounds cockeyed. I mean, Curly's theory. But I was kind of worried when I got to thinking, so... Listen, Georgia. Yes, don't let anyone in the house till I get home. No, no, I won't, Steve. Not anyone, do you hear? Not anyone. Oh, uh, Steve, wait. What? Oh, wait, Steve, it's a... Uh, thank goodness at last. Now I can breathe easy. Darling, just a minute. Georgia. Hello. Hello, Georgia. Mr. Frank? Mr. Frank. Georgia, can you hear me? Thank Georgia, goodness you've come. Please, step in. It's uh, the Georgia. lock on this door I want... Just a moment, my, my husband's on the phone. Can you hear me, Georgia? Steve? Yeah, what happened? There was something else I wanted to tell you. It's all right, darling. Everything's all right now, Steve. You needn't worry. Didn't I just hear you talking to someone? Was that somebody at the door? No, it's no one, dear. It's just mi- Mr. Frank, the locksmith. The locksmith. Cut a load. Georgia, listen. Listen, Georgia. That's what I was going to tell you. What is The police are on a new trail. They think maybe a locksmith. Georgia, you're listening. They think maybe the creeper's a locksmith. Oh. Get him out, quick. What nice lipstick you Georgia, use, can you hear Mrs. Grant. Oh, yes. Georgia. Very nice lipstick. Georgia. Very nice. Can you hear me, Georgia? Georgia. Can... Georgia. Hello, Georgia. Hello. Hello, who's this? Hurry. Catch me before I kill more. For heaven's sake. Soft footsteps hurrying down the corridor, away from the door with the broken lock now standing ajar, the body of a red-headed woman. And still, should she not have known that her only visitor would be death when the clocks struck twelve for murder at midnight? <laughs> Remember to be with us again when death knocks at the door, wearing a familiar face, and the clocks strike twelve for murder at midnight. The part of Georgia was played by Ann Shepard. With music by Charles Paul, Murder at Midnight was directed by Anton M. Leader. in just a minute in The Man Who Died Yesterday.
And now, Murder at Midnight. Tales of mystery and terror by radio's masters of the macabre. Our story by William Morwood is The Man Who Died Yesterday. Afternoon on a little traveled highway. A strange-looking man in threadbare clothes stands hopefully by the roadside. A car comes around a curve, slows up, and stops. Looking for a lift? Are you headed for New York? That's me. Hop in. Thank you. It's very good of you. I am in a hurry to reach New York. I haven't much time, you see. Yeah, sure. I picked you right off for a big executive on his way to a board meeting. Oh, nothing like that. <laughs> it's just that oh, there's something terribly important I've got to do. A mission. Oh, Salvation Army, huh? No, United Nations. I have to see the Secretary General before midnight tonight. That leaves me only eight hours. The United... Are you feeling all right, pal? Yes. I was sick, but I'm feeling fine now. You don't look so good to me. What is a ghost? Of course, you could do with a haircut, too. I suppose so. I'm afraid I've been out of touch with civilization a long while. By the way, my name is... Or rather was... David Hepgood. Hi. I'm Walt Griggs. Can't you drive any faster, Walt? We've still got a long way to go, and... Well, I'm worried about this part of the road. There's going to be a rock slide and... Rock slide? Oh, you mean those signs? Ah, that's nothing to worry about. They put them up on... Put the... It's all right. Keep going, Walt. We got through safely. Yeah, but there was a rock slide, just like you said. Of course, but... How did you know? I can see ahead, Walt. See into the future for 24 hours. The guy was nuts, of course, but... Still, what are the odds against calling a long shot like that? A million to one? A billion? I gave up trying to figure it. We drove along for about an hour and then stopped for gas. There was this hamburger joint right by. Where are we going, Walt? Grab a bite. Oh, but there isn't time. I've less than seven hours now, and by midnight you I... got a gas up anyway, and I'm hungry. Come on, Hep. Hi, you fellas. Hello, sugar. Sit down, Hep. What'll it be, boys? Hamburger for me, sweetheart, with onions. What's yours, Hep? I... I'm not hungry. Oh, busy with your speech for the United Nations, huh? Well, I'll just read this racing form while you're thinking. Racing form? Sure, I play the G's all the time. Got some important dough on today's meet. Fifty bucks on Alistair to win in the sixth. Alistair? Yep. I'm afraid you'll lose your money, Walt. What? Don't kid me. Alistair's the hot favorite. It's going to be a walk away. Marble the third won that race. Marble? How do you nuts? He's a rank outsider, a hundred... What do you mean, won the race? It hasn't been run yet. Hasn't it? I didn't know. Look, I... Wait a minute. Sweetheart. Yeah? You think you can get the races in the radio? Oh, sure. It's all tuned in. A lot of our customers like to listen. Well, if we can't waste time like this. Who can think about a horse race I like... can. Remember my 50 bucks. What? Shh. The great race. The crowd is going wild with excitement. They're around the bend now, coming into the straight. Alice there is out in front by two lanes. Uh -huh. The rest of the horses bunch. Alice there is going strong. And a boy, where's your marble half? Wait. Entering the last stretch now. It's a walk away for Alice there. Nice, Four isn't? lanes ahead and no challenger. Wait a minute. Alice there stumbles. Can't regain stride. He's down. What? The jockey's thrown clear, but Alice there is... The other horses have gone fast. Number eight is out in front. Number eight. Marble the third. Marble the third. Marble the third, and Marble wins! We owe! Ah, turn that thing That's off. That's run for the books, folks. The most extraordinary... Marble wins. You knew it all the time, Hap. You knew Marble had to win. Of course. 
Sport, we've got to go. Sure. Sure, Hap, anything you say. You're the guy I've been waiting for all my life. I didn't need no more figuring to tell me Hap was a gold mine. And I had him first before anybody else could get their hooks into him. The only thing that worried me was the way he talked. All this about midnight and not having much time. I had to use him while I had him, even if it meant taking chances. So while we drove, I worked on a plan. Walt, we've left the New York road. The signs are pointing the other way. I know. I'm taking a shortcut through a town called Hassock. Hassock? Yeah. That name mean anything to you, Hap? Hassock? Think hard. Let me see. There's going to be a holdup there tonight at the factory. Two men involved. They steal the week's payroll, ten thousand dollars. Ten grand, huh? Did they get away with it? Yeah, there's a chase, but they shake off the police. Great. Couldn't be better. Why? We're the two men, Hap. You and me. What? No, Walt, no, I'm not a criminal. And I've something else to do with what little time I have left. You're coming with me, Hap. Maybe this will convince you. The gun doesn't frighten me. Stop the car and let me out. I've got to get to New York. All right, look, I'll make a deal with you. You come with me on the stick-up, and I'll drive you straight through to New York without stopping. Are you on? But, but I can't, Walt. My message concerns the whole world. It's the only way you'll get to deliver it. Well, if, if it is the only way, all right. But there's something more I've got to tell you, Walt. What's that? We leave a dead man behind. <laughs> getting dark when we hit town. I drove down the main street and onto the factory building beyond. It was all dark except for a light in the cashier's office. Hap and I went in. There was a guy sitting at a desk. Who, who are you? What do you want? The ten grand in that safe. This is a stick-up, brother. You, you're crazy. There's no ten... Open up. I'll do the talking. I, I warn you, men. You'll be caught for Shut this... up and start turning that dial. All right. I guess you win. Come on, come on. Snap into it. I'm doing the best I can. That's it. Now hand out those greenbacks. Come on, get a move on. Watch out, Walt. He's turning in an alarm. You double cross and rat. Oh, hey, carry you. Is the guy that had to be killed, Hap? Yes. Okay, then step on it. The cops will be swarming around like flies. <laughs> Gaining on us, Walt. I can't go any faster. I'm down to the floorboards already. They'll start shooting soon. You sure we get away? There's no slip up? No. We get away all right. Good. Ah! Where did they get you, Walt? My arm. What do we do, Hap? Keep driving till we hit that bend in the road. Yeah? There's a clump of willows around the corner. Pull in there. Okay. Here goes. Douse the lights. Off. Just like you said. No hurry. Get back to the New York road. I've less than three hours left. Okay, but i got to stop and see a doctor. A doctor? Sure, my arm. Well, what's the matter, Hap? I, I'm afraid of that doctor. Something happens there that I don't understand. What is it? I don't know. But it's something I should have explained before. I can see into the future for you, Walt, and for everyone else. But not for myself. Doctor? What can I do for you? Oh, my arm. I had a little accident. I was cleaning my gun and it went off. Come into my office. Okay. And this man? Oh, he's just a friend of mine. Nothing the matter with him. I don't agree. Looks much sicker than you do. No, Doctor, really. Your face. It's the color of... No, no I'm all right. Believe me. Please hurry with my friend. It'll only take a second. Just get my stethoscope. Look, let's quit kidding around, Doc. I'm the one Quiet. that... Quiet. Hmm. Good. Good Lord. What's the matter, Doc? 
Why are you looking at him like that? Well, it's, it's impossible, of course, but there's no heartbeat. No. But, but that's impossible. If, if your heart wasn't beating, you'd be dead. Yes. I've been dead since yesterday at midnight. Staring at him was the living corpse of the man who died yesterday, Walt, and the doctor draw back in horror. Just who is David Hapgood? Perhaps we'll know when the clock strikes 12 for murder at midnight. <laughs> Now, back to Murder at Midnight and The Man Who Died Yesterday. The goose pimples were standing out on me. Here I'd found the guy, been with him for hours, through a holdup and a killing. And now I was hearing from his own lips that he was dead. It gave me the creeps. I wanted to take it on the land, but instead I was froze to the floor. I heard the doc saying... You've been dead since yesterday? Yes, doctor. But that's, that's impossible. There must be some explanation, some obscure heart condition. There is an explanation, but not that kind. You see, I was cheated out of 24 hours at the time of my birth. Yes? And I'm just making up for it now. But how do you mean? But this will sound fantastic to you, but nevertheless it's true... I was born on a ship crossing the international date line. I started coming into the world during the last moments of a Friday and finished up early on Sunday. So I skipped a whole day of my life. I've always been living 24 hours ahead of myself. But, but that's sheer... It's gospel, Doc. He can call the turn on anything like he was reading tomorrow's paper. Yes. I told you it would sound fantastic, Doctor. But it is true. When I realized it, I... Well, I tried not to use it for selfish ends... I wanted to help people, but I never could. People would never listen to me, believe me. Finally, I realized that there was no place for me in the world, that man wasn't meant to know the future. So I went away, up into the woods. Uh, how long ago? About ten years ago. Away from civilization, it was easier. I still knew what was going to happen, of course, but with no way to communicate my knowledge, my conscience was at rest. That is, until last night. Last night? I had caught a cold. It developed into pneumonia. I was deathly sick. I couldn't breathe and uh, lost consciousness. Then suddenly, at midnight, I was well. Quite well. Not a trace of my illness. I knew what had happened, of course. I was dead. Dead. But I still had my missing day to live. I knew I must use it for the benefit of mankind. How? There's something I know. Something that involves the fate of millions of people. Unless some action is taken within the next few hours. But what action? What is it? I'm sorry, but I can't tell you, Doctor. I can't tell anyone except the Secretary General of the United Nations. And I must reach him before midnight, before I'm really dead. It's getting on to 10 o'clock. Now do you understand why I'm in such a hurry? I'll say, let's get going, Hap. Never mind about my arm. That can wait. No, listen to me, Hap. You can't leave. What? As far as you're being able to read the future is concerned, well, it doesn't matter whether I believe that or not, but that heart condition of yours, that's something unique in medical history. Now, you've got to let me take you to a hospital where it can be studied properly. Stay off that stuff, now, I'll phone for an ambulance. Stay away from that phone. He's mine. Yours. But do you realize what this can mean to science? To don't give me that talk. You just want to grab him off for yourself. Why, nonsense. Stop it. Stop it, both of you. I don't belong to anyone. I'm not a specimen to be examined. I've got a mission to perform for all of civilization. I've got to get to the United Nations now, before... Now, now, no matter how you've been deluding yourself, young man, you're terribly sick. I'm going to phone the hospital Okay, and... you asked for it. You, you... I must get away from here. Hap. Hap, come back here. Come back here. Okay, if you're dead, it won't hurt you, and if you're not... Oh! Holy smoke. That bullet went right through you and only knocked you down. 
Let go of me, Walt. You try to run away, huh? I've got to get to New York. Nothing can stop. You're coming with me, Hap. I got plans for us as long as you last. You've got your ten thousand. What more do you want? A chance to run it up to a hundred thousand, and we can do it. I know the police, and you can call the cards. But there's no time. I'm figuring on only a couple of hours. That's plenty. Listen, Walt. I'm asking you for the last time. Let go. Do a decent thing for once in your life. Nuts. What I'm trying to do, it's for you as much for millions of others. I never gave a cuss about the others, and I'm not starting now. All right, Walt. Then it has to be this way. Hap, drop that gun. I'm sorry, Walt. Very sorry. I'd known all along that you had to die tonight. But I didn't know that I'd kill you. Kind of a silent type, ain't you? Sorry? Oh, that's all right. I don't like fellows that gab too much. You know, it, it was nice of you to pick me up back there on the road. Well, I was lonely. Besides, I, uh, well, I needed reassurance. How's that? You see, I've been out of touch with civilization for some time, and the people I've met today weren't inspiring. <laughs> You're a strange guy, do you know? Am I? Yeah, I mean, the way you talk and look. You don't look quite real. Oh, now, now don't get me wrong. I, I like you a lot. Oh, I'm glad. Well, for instance, we've been driving for nearly an hour now, and you haven't even made a pass at me once. I'm afraid that wouldn't do either of us much good. Yeah, but just the same, a girl appreciates a little thing like that. Incidental, what's your name? Well, you can call me Hap. Hi, Hap. I'm Hazel. How do you do? Well, I guess I ought to tell you something about myself. Well, I know a little already. Huh? You're going to New York to find your fiancé, aren't you? Yeah, a guy called... Say, how'd you know that? You're going to look him up in the phone book and then call. And then you're going to uh, find out that he's married. What? Oh, you're kidding me. Jim wouldn't do a thing like that. He'd wait for me forever. He said he would. And Hey, why are we stopping? Almost out of gas. Howdy, folks. Uh, fill her up as quickly as possible. Okay. Uh, how far to New York from here? Well, you ought to be at George Washington Bridge in about ten minutes. Fine. You folks hear about all the excitement on the highway? No, what happened? Well, the cops are looking for a crazy killer. Murdered three people. One was a stick-up, the other two was a doctor and his own sidekick. Oh, what's he look like? Well, according to the radio, he's got, got a chalk white face, a... Mop of hair that looks like it hasn't been cut in weeks. No hat and, uh, and... What's the matter, bud? What are you staring at? Your, your friend, I... I, I gotta get something out of the office. I'll be back in a minute. He's going to phone the police. This is your chance to get out, Hazel. Oh, no, I'm staying with you, Hap. Now, you better get moving and keep moving. <laughs> sign we're being followed. We may make it yet. Are you frightened, Hazel? Being with me? I guess I should be, but I'm not. Thank you. Somehow I, I can't believe you're crazy. If you killed anyone, you knew what you were doing and you had a good reason. Thank you again. You don't know what that means to me. Have people always been scared of you, Hap? Most people. Till I met you. Why couldn't I have met you sooner, Hazel? Well, what's wrong with now? It's a little late. Not for me. You honestly mean that? Sure. Well, then perhaps it's going to be all right after all. Perhaps we'll meet again. What do you mean? I didn't mean to tell you this. Perhaps I shouldn't now. It may cause you pain. Go ahead. I can stand it. After you call Jim, your fiancé, and find that he's married, you... Start across the street in the days. A taxi is driving too fast and. Uh... It's got my number on it, huh? Yes, I'm sorry. And yet, in a way, 
What did that sign say, Hazel? Uh, uh, George Washington Bridge, two miles. Oh, I'm going to make it. There's still time. The Secretary General is in his home. But let me in when they hear my message. I'll have most of an hour with him. It's not quite 11 yet. 11? Hey, your watch must have stopped. What? Well, look, look, there's a clock in the building. Where? Up to the right, there. Three minutes of 12. Oh. Well, what's the matter, Hat? Oh, I can't make it. Oh, I've lost. Unless they telephone. There's still time for that. Well, why are you stopping here? There's no phone. In that house, the family's all in bed upstairs. There's a telephone in the parlor. But the door is sure to be locked. They've forgotten to latch the parlor window. Hey, how do you know all these things? Never mind now. Goodbye, Hazel. But I'll be waiting here. No, you'd better start down the road. The police mustn't find me. But when you come back, I'll be here. I won't be back, Hazel. This is goodbye. For keeps. But you've got to come back. You've got to. Operator, get me the Secretary General of the United Nations at his home. Hurry, please, it's urgent. Hello? The Secretary General, please, it's terribly important. No, I've got to speak to him personally. I... Oh. Midnight. Hello? Will you get him for me? There's no time left and... Oh. Never mind. I'll tell you. It's... It's about... <gasps> in this window. We'd better go in and have a look. There was a girl with him when he left my gas station. She ought to be around. Where's here. the light? Here. There he is, on the floor. And he looks... He's dead, all right. No wonder. Look at that hole in his chest. Wait a minute. There's something funny here. That wound never bled. Huh? The only way that could happen is if he was dead before the bullet hit him. Two men staring at a corpse that is finally still. And still forever. The corpse of the man who died yesterday. While outside, somewhere in the night, a restless spirit keeps a rendezvous that none can avoid. And the distant clocks chime the last notes in epilogue for murder at midnight. to be with us again when death brings time to a full stop and the clocks strike 12 for murder at midnight. The part of David Hapgood was played by Stuart Brody. Vandell Kramer was Walt. With music by Charles Paul, Murder at Midnight was directed by Anton M. Leader. Thank you.
in So lovely. Everything about you. Your eyes, your lips, your lovely white throat. I can feel it pulsing under my hands, throbbing. No, Frank, you're hurting me. You're choking me. You're... No! Midnight, the witching hour when the night is darkest, our fears the strongest, and our strength at its lowest ebb. Midnight. When the graves gape open and death strikes. How? You'll learn the answer in just a minute in... Till Death Do Us Part. Now, Murder at Midnight, Tales of Mystery and Terror by Radio's Masters of the Macabre. Our story by Joseph Ruskell is, Till Death Do Us Part. I never saw a man who looked with such a wistful eye upon that little tent of blue which prisoners call the sky. Ruth, I want to tell you something. Put down that book and listen. Hmm? I love you. <laughs> some love too little, some too long. Some sell and others buy. Some do the deed with many tears and some without a sigh. You hear me, Ruth? I love you. Some do it with a bitter look. Some with a flattering word. Professor Clark. (laughs) Yes, Professor Clark. Love me, darling. Wildly. Put the book away. Almost there now. Bridal sweet waiting. Oh, Frank. Promise you'll always love me. Till death do us part. Another glass, darling. Come on. It's sweet to dance to violins when love and life are fair. To dance to flute. To dance to lute is delicate and rare. But it is not so sweet with nimble feet to... uh... To dance upon the air. Frank. Darling. You've hardly kissed me. Why are you looking at me like that? You're so lovely. Come over here to the couch. (laughs) A shy bridegroom in this day and age? Darling, why are you acting so strangely? Well, if the mountain won't come to Mohammed... Come here, my lord and master. Kiss me. Oh, Ruth, I love you so much. (sighs) Darling, why do you keep staring at me like that? Frank. Ruth, no. Uh, Darling, what's the matter? I don't know. Please, Frank, after all. No, don't come near me. Don't touch me. Ruth, something terrible is happening to me. It's a feeling... It's too dreadful to believe. What is it? When I take you in my arms, when I kiss you, I love you and I want you so that I feel a hideous urge to... To what, darling? To strangle you to death. Shaving. Finishing up now. Morning, Professor. Morning, Professor. Life is wonderful. Wonderful. (laughs) How? Thank you. Leave us enter the parlor, husband. Yes. Leave us eat, my bride. (laughs) (laughs) Ah! What what feast is this that tempts my palate? Fall to, spouse. (laughs) (laughs) Ah! Citrus! My favorite ice squirt. <laughs> I, I'm so happy, I feel like dancing. It's sweet to dance to violin. Yeah, that's right, how's it go? It's sweet to dance to violin. 
when love and life are fair. Eat, dear. What's wrong? I guess I'm not very hungry. Frank, you're thinking of that incident last night again. You are, aren't you? How could I have said that to you? I can't understand it. What got into me? Now, darling, you're to forget it. Don't talk about it anymore. Don't even think of it. It was just your little joke. Some joke. Wonder I didn't frighten you to death. Well... The funny thing is, the next minute I was laughing at myself, and so were you. But when I said it, I... Ruth, I... I, I, I can't explain it. I can't eat now. Frank. It was like an obsession. Yes, that's it. It, 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 was, it. it was an obsession. Ruth, you're a psychologist. What does it mean? To have felt that horrible urge to, to do that to you. To you. I must have been mad. Now, darling, don't say that. Don't spoil our honeymoon with this nonsense. You'll be talking things into yourself. I don't know what it is. Your, your nerves are on edge from your accident. That terrible crash just three months ago. Please, Ruth, please. I don't want to think about it. I can still see it, that horrible, twisted wreck. Well, you're lucky you're alive. Be thankful, I She am. was hitting 80, showing off. I couldn't stop her, that daffy little sister of yours. Darling. I'm sorry, dear. I'm sorry. I guess I felt as awful about it as you did. Brilliant student could have been one of my best if she'd ever opened a book. The poor kid, what a way to die. Maybe if I, if I hadn't accepted a lift to town, who knows? She might still now, be... Now, please, please, darling. Let's forget it. It's not good for you. You haven't been at all yourself ever since then. No, I haven't. Have I? Well, everything has its compensation, dear. After all, that's what brought us together. Closely, I mean. Yes, that's right. In the hospital, what... You were an angel. Oh. Well, you were just an angel from heaven, the way you helped to nurse me through all that time, when I was only half conscious, nursed me and read to me. Read to me. Yes. The way you read to me. Why do you say it like that, Frank? Well, I don't know. There's something you read to me over and over when I was barely conscious. I've heard it ever since, deep down. I can't seem to recall it, but I feel that it had something to do with my crazy behavior last night. A, a line. It's still with me. It never seems to leave me. Seems to make me want to do something horrible. Now, Frank, stop talking. You're ill again. You're pale as a ghost. What is that line? I've got to know. Please, darling, please stop shouting. I'm with you. Your love is with you. Now, now kiss me, dear. Hold me tight. Oh, so lovely. Everything about you. Your eyes, your lips, your lovely white throat. Mm. I feel it pulsing. I can feel your throat pulsing, darling, in my hands. Pulsing. No, Frank. You're hurting me. Oh, you're choking me. No! Yes, sir? I'm checking out. Your room number, 438. Uh, call me a cab. From the bridal suite? Well, just a moment. There's something wrong, sir. You and your wife just checked in last night. Any complaint? No, no complaint. Just call me a cab. Oh, an emergency. What business is it of yours? Where's another hotel? Why, you'll find it very difficult in New York without a reservation. And if you and your wife... I'm only... checking out. Who said anything about my wife? She's better off without me, do you hear? Well, what are you gawking at? She's very lovely, remember? Would you make a nice corpse in a bridal suite? <laughs> oh, go to the devil. Where to now, mister? Where now? Uh, just shake off that other cat. I did. Three hours ago. I told you ten times. What now? Just drive around the park. We've been around and around and around. How long can this go on? That line. What was that line? What was it? Huh? What was that line? Look, pal, we going over that again, too? What line? You want the seventh avenue line? If I'm not talking out of turn, but you must have lifted quite a few today. Get me to a hotel. We tried a dozen. Remember, they're full up. Hey, just who are you, mister? What's your racket? What's that to you? Okay, okay, I just asked. 
I was a teacher, cabby, in a woman's college. But that's only a blind. My name is Jack the Ripper, see? But some people just call me Bluebeard. <laughs> Bluebeard? Huh? This is the end of my line, chum. Pay up and get out. No, no, I won't. You can't make me get out. You can't. I can't, huh? No, because if I do get out, I may go back. And if I go back, don't you understand? I'll kill her. For richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health till death do us part. A bridegroom, dazed and obsessed, standing on a city street, fearing to return to his bride, because he knows if he does, it will mean... Murder! At Midnight. And now, back to Murder at Midnight and Till Death Do Us Part. What do you want? Good evening, sir. My name is Blue Pierce. You're the proprietor of this charming boarding house. You're drunk. Forsooth, is true. May I tarry the night? No vacancies. Go on now, get on your way. Where's his room? <sighs> Top floor. Rear, Mrs. Clark. He came in about an hour ago, drunk as you please, and he asked for a single. I'm not one to rent to drunks, mind you, but uh, I can see he's really educated and a gentleman, though a queer one, if you ask me, with his eyes all bloodshot. Well, here it is. Did he say when he'll be back? He said he was going for his bags. I'll just wait in his room, if you don't mind. Hmm. It's all right. I'm his wife, I tell you. Well, I don't know. Something mighty fishy about all this. Well, excuse me. There's the hall phone. If it's not one thing, it's another. All right. All right. Hello? Yes? Who? Who? Oh, just a minute. It's him, ma'am. He wants to talk to the lady who just came in. Let me speak to him. Hello, Frank. I saw you go in. What are you doing in my house? Darling, it's so good to hear your voice again. I was so worried. Answer me. What are you doing there? How did you know where to find me? I've been following you everywhere. I don't want you to leave me, darling. I love you. Get out of there. Stop haunting me. I'm no good for you. Haven't you had enough? Go away. I won't. You need me. I'm your wife. Come back to me, Frank. Come back. How can you still want me? What are you inviting? Why don't you take a train home? Do you want to die? You know I'll kill you the next time we're alone. You know I've gone mad. Now, don't say that. You're just ill, and I'll nurse you back to health. Oh, Frank, this is your wife talking. What sort of spineless thing do you suppose you've married? What would you have me do, run to the police and ask them to protect me from my husband? Run to the police and cry that the man I love wants to kill me? Run to the police and police? tell Police, him... that's right. Of course. Why didn't I think of that before? No, Frank. Frank! Frank, what are you going to do? Have a seat, Mrs. Clark. What is it you want of me, Inspector Wade? Why was I called here to the police station? You've no idea? No. Oh. Is he here, my husband? He told you? But I thought he was just drunk. Oh, I told him not to come here. I told him not to. Then it's all true? <laughs> yes. This beats anything I've ever heard. Man loves wife so much he wants to strangle her. Kisses her. Gets an irresistible yen to choke her to death. And on their honeymoon. You want to prefer charges? Prefer charges? What for? Well, attempted homicide ought to cover it. I won't. He's my husband. I love him. I'll stick by him no matter what. But he ought to at least be sent to Bellevue for a mental... Oh, no, you won't. There's nothing mentally wrong with Frank. Nothing at all. It's simply nerves. The result of an accident he had recently. 
This really takes the cake. Mrs. Clark, another thing that puzzles me. Yes. He kept raving about a line when he staggered in here, as if it were life or death. A line of poetry he couldn't remember. Wanted me to tell him what it was. <laughs> Confidentially, I've only read one poem in my life. Now, now, what's what's that all about? I haven't the vaguest notion, Inspector. Just part of his neurotic state, I suppose. When we get back to our hotel room, What? I... You want him back after what happened? Yes. Don't you see, I must cure him of that awful obsession. Who else can do it but me? I I'd like to see him now, Inspector. Please release him to me. I'll take the consequences. He's not here. Not here? No. We held him overnight just to let him sober up like we would any other drunk. Thought it was just all boozy eyewash. Well, this morning he seemed a new man and laughed it all off. So we released him. Just a few minutes ago. Oh, wonderful. But then I had a hunch I ought to warn you anyway. Just a hunch. Warn me? Yeah. He said he was going to call on you tonight at the hotel for a little reunion. Oh, how marvelous. Maybe he's all cured. I don't know. I didn't like the way he, he smiled when he said it. Mrs. Clark, after what you just told me, I think I ought to have him picked up again. You'll do no such thing. It's taking your life in your hands. I think he's got wheels in his head. I don't care. I love him. You die just as dead when you're in love. I'm not afraid. I'll never leave him. Certainly not now when he needs me more than ever. Is that all, Inspector? Okay, lady. <laughs> you're 14 carat. He sure doesn't deserve a wife like you. And don't say I didn't warn you. It's your funeral. Thank you, Inspector. Goodbye. Oh, uh, Mrs. Clark, there's one more thing perhaps I ought to tell you. Yes. When I released him just a while ago, he said something else that puzzled me. That being in jail had suddenly given him revelation. He smiled very queerly when he said it. Oh? I think maybe uh, he found that line of poetry, Mrs. Clark. Hello? Ruth? Where are you, Frank? In the lobby. Come up. I don't know exactly what your game is, my sweet bride. But I'm warning you. I've had revelation. I know. It's high time. I'm going to finish it, Ruth, this time. You asked for it. Come up, Frank. Sure? Sure. Your funeral. Howard does it with a kiss. Come in, Frank. The door's open. Throwing a party, my dear? Yes. Who's invited? You and I. What are we celebrating? An uninvited guest at our honeymoon. Death has come with you, hasn't it, this time? Yes. Shall we drink to him? Why not? Do you still love me, Frank? Yes, I still love you. But I love you better when you're dead for what you've done. How much do you know? Not enough. It came to me in jail last night. The jail had something to do with it. How, I still don't know. But enough to make me remember something you whispered in the hospital when I was just coming to. You said... I'll get my revenge, Frank. Do you hear me? I'll get my revenge. Splendid. Hey, from memory. What else? Enough to make me realize that you hate me and have always hated me, although you pretended otherwise. Brilliant. Say loved and hated you. Go on. And that somehow, I don't know myself in what way, but I'm sure it must be a very clever way, as your psychology students would agree, you've been coldly, deliberately torturing me, trying to make me think myself a maniac, or have others think so. Close enough. Why, what I can't understand is why you did it, or why you weren't afraid that I'd really murder you. You'll soon find out. And I'm convinced now that you've done it all with a single line. A single line of poetry. In my jail cell, I was sure of it. The very walls seemed to tell me, I don't know why, that it was a line that you kept reading to me at the hospital. 
over and over and over again that made me think I wanted to kill you. And what was that lie? That's what I'm going to find out right now. Don't come any closer, Professor. Well, no, it's perfectly ridiculous. Looking at you now, close to you where I can almost touch you, that crazy obsession is still with me. I laugh at it intellectually. I know that you've tricked me into it by some very obvious power of suggestion, but I still... I still feel that way. Don't come any nearer. I'm warning you. Isn't it eerie? I still love you and can strangle you for my love. And will. Uh, Stay where you are. You're not going to kill me, darling. I'm going to kill you. Now, do you see why I wasn't afraid of you? That gun. You've had it all the time. Correct, my love. Right here in the wine table drawer. I've planned this all along, Angel. From the very first. Before we were even married. Yes, your intuition was right. From the day you and my little sister were brought to the hospital after the accident. From the day she died. And the doctor said you'd pull through. I planned it all. And it's worked out like a perfect equation every step of the way. Why? Why? I had to commit the perfect crime, and I've done it. Even the police will testify that it was self-defense against a homicidal maniac. And when they find you here with a bullet in your head, they'll congratulate me. But what's this? I still don't understand. It had to be the perfect crime because I must go free. You see, one life has already paid for yours. And court for court, your blood is worth no more than my family's. I don't understand this at all. What did I ever do? You killed my sister. I killed her? She told me before she left on that drive with you that she was going to crash the car. She left before I could stop her. She told me everything, Frank, including what you'd done to her. Everything. I see. So that's it. Well, I don't suppose it would be of any use my trying to convince you. No, no use. I've waited a long time for this moment. Revenge is sweet. And it was such fun to torture you. I used a weapon I knew. Of course, it was power of suggestion. Sure, you guessed it. But what a pity you don't know the line yet. What was it? What was it? Tell me. Tell me. Don't keep me in torture. Keep back. Think hard, Frank. Think all around it. What about a jail and the revelation it gave you? What about a famous poet who wrote a famous poem while in jail? Why... Yes, yes? Oscar Wilde. That's it. Yes, that's it from Oscar Wilde. A ballad. Of course, a ballad. The ballad of Reading Jail. How could it ever have escaped me? Why, you witch, you've even been reading from it on our honeymoon. (laughs) But what part? What verse? What line? What was the line? Don't take another step or I'll pull the trigger. Give me the line. I say I still can't think of the line. Keep back, keep back or I'll shoot. Oh, no, you won't. One more step and I'll shoot. Tell me that line or I'll kill you. All men kill the thing they love. Remember, Frank? How's the next line go, Mrs. Clark? (laughs) By all, let this be heard. So I heard. Too bad I was a little late. Inspector Wade. You know, ma'am, like I said, I only read one poem in my whole life. But ain't it the darndest thing? It happened to be the Ballad of Reading Jail. Till death do us part A honeymoon in the bridal suite Red wine spilled on the table And red blood on the floor As the clock strikes twelve for Murder!
Remember to be with us again when death's key turns in the lock and the clocks strike twelve for murder at midnight. The part of Professor Ruth Clark was played by Elspeth Eric, Professor Frank Clark by Eric Dressler. With music by Charles Paul, Murder at Midnight was directed by Anton M. Leader.